The next speaker is Lawrence Eberhardt, who is going to talk about the landscape of 2D string theories. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me join the other speakers to thank the organizers for organizing this wonderful conference in a very wonderful place. So thank you very much. And uh, today I'll talk about work in collaboration with uh, fantastic collaborators, Scott Collier, Beatrix Muhlmann, and uh, Victor Rodriguez. We put out one paper last year, and uh, the second part of the talk is uh, work in progress. Okay, so let me start. So we all know that the landscape of string vacuum is extremely complicated, but there's one place where it's much simpler, and if you just consider bosonic string theory with a 2D target space. What I mean by 2D target space for the purpose of this talk, especially any string theory that, bosonic string theory that does not have a tachyon. Uh, we'll see examples. And uh, that one is much more uh, controlled. And essentially there are two examples in the literature. One is the so-called PQ minimal string. I'll explain what that means. And it's well known that it's dual to a double scaled uh, two matrix model. And there's another example, which is the seek to one string, um, which is a free boson coupled to Liouville theory on a world sheet, which is dual to matrix quantum mechanics. So that's a very restricted set of examples. So there's a question, uh, is that all? And can we uh, show that it's all? Can we classify that landscape? And so on. Okay, so today I'll just talk, uh, focus on these uh, types of models, uh, namely the minimal string. I will not talk about uh, the seek to one string. So the persistent paradigm here is that if we uh, construct some string world sheet theory that is uh, consistent of a matter theory, and uh, we complement it with a Liouville theory such that the total central charge is 26, and couple it to the usual BC ghosts that we have in string theory to make the path integral wall defined, then we can integrate over the moduli space and we get some string theory. And uh, because we just took basically these two very simple ingredients of a matter CFT, uh, we'll see what, what kind of matter CFTs we can take. Um, and the Liouville theory, we get very simple sort of holographic descriptions if you want. Um, or, and the types of theories that appear as the uh, space-time theories or the holographic duals can be written as double-scaled uh, two matrix integrals. So these are just these uh, types of matrix integrals where you have two matrices that you integrate over uh, with sum of two potentials and they are coupled in a simple way. Sometimes even one matrix model is enough. Okay, so one way to plot the kind of theories that exist in this, uh, of this kind is uh, to plot them in the space of center charges of the matter theory. So your matter theory can have any center charge that you want, and then you put the corresponding Liouville theory whose center charge is 26 minus that center charge to make up the string theory. Basically these PQ minimal uh, models, so the PQ minimal string is located, uh, represented by these uh, red crosses. Um, so the center charge of the matter theory, it's a very zero minimal model and can be, uh, can be, takes values less than one, and there's basically a dense set it can take. So there's some rationality condition on the central charge. Um, but today I'll discuss that this is not all, and uh, there's at least two more constructions you can do uh, that are quite interesting, I think. And basically the first construction I'll tell you about covers this whole, uh, whole real, part, uh, this whole interval from minus infinity to one. So now it's not just a dense set, it's the whole real line. Uh, and then there's a second construction, which is a bit more funny, where the center charge is actually complex. And you make a, a matter theory of complex center charge. So I don't know whether that's everything you can do, but that's at least uh, two more entries in this uh, kind of landscape of minimal string theories. So let me explain uh, these uh, theories. So let's start with the simplest one. Uh, and I'll not take, so, the simplest case is when you don't take the p comma q minimal string, but just the two comma p minimal string. In general, the, in the p comma q minimal string, p and q need to be co-prime. So two comma p is the sim simplest thing essentially. And uh, in this case, the minimal, uh, the matter theory just consists, consists of this very zero minimum model. And very zero minimum models are specified by two co-prime integers. Uh, and then as before, we couple it to Liouville theory and uh, to ghosts to make up some string theory. And so it has been known since the 90s that there's a dual matrix model description. And basically, it's a double scaled matrix model again. 
uh, now a single matrix is sufficient. And the, uh, to specify the matrix model, basically we just have to specify the density of states at leading order in large n. And the density of states takes this form. So it's like a slightly complicated looking function, but it's polynomial actually you can uh, use. Well, yeah. um, okay, so that's, um, that covers some part of uh, the negative real axis or real axis less than one. And, um, but now it's not dense, so it's some, seri some series of theories. And uh, one thing that has been discussed recently in the literature is that if you take a limit where you take this p to infinity, things actually simplify. So now you go off to minus infinity in the central charge, and the theory reduces to a theory uh, that is called JT gravity in the literature. It's a theory that um, we'll encounter later. It's, uh, it's basically a theory that just computes the wide peterson volumes of surfaces. Okay, um, we can uh, move on to the p comma q minimal string where p and q are now general but still co prime integers. So there, it's exactly the same on the word sheet except that I replace this with the p q minimal model. And uh, it still enjoys a matrix model dual, but now we need to have a double scaled two matrix model. And uh, to specify the two matrix model, um, the most convenient way to do so essentially is to specify the so called spectral curve. Um, so the spectral curve is some Riemann surface and all the perturbative quantities of, uh, so that you derive in the one over n expansion of the matrix model are, um, take value or naturally live on this Riemann surface. So in this case, uh, it takes the simple form where x of z is a Chebyshev polynomial of z and y of z is a Chebyshev polynomial also of z of degrees p and q. And z is just some rational parameterization of that curve. Okay. Um, so now let's move on to the new models. So one thing that we looked at is that there are more matter theories than just this minimum models that you can take. And one is uh, known as time-like Liouville theory in the literature. So you can couple Liouville theory to time-like Liouville theory. Time-like Liouville theory is a theory that exists for any central charge less than one. So any real central charge that you want. And again, you put your goals uh, to define a string theory. And you can ask, uh, so this is a tachyon free bosonic string theory. So you can ask, is there also a dual matrix model? And we'll turn out yes, the answer is yes. Uh, and there's actually a one matrix model dual. So one matrix is enough. But now uh, the density of states takes this form. So it's a more complicated function. It's no longer polynomial and it grows exponentially fast if you go to high energies. Um, and we'll encounter this, these string amplitudes later on in this uh, theory and they will turn out to be uh, deformations of Y Peterson volumes. Okay, and so the last thing I'll discuss later on is this uh, other theory that we very tentatively call Liouville squared string theory, but we're, we're very open to better suggestions uh, for this name. And uh, so basically this is uh, now, I couple two Liouville theories to each other. So both are ordinary Liouville theories, but the funny thing is that they have complex central charges. So Liouville theory exists for any central charge where the central charge is actually not in the interval from minus infinity to one. But in particular, I can choose this, uh, this combination, 13 plus imaginary and 30 minus imaginary, so that the sum is again 26. And now you see, you can think of one Liouville theory as being the complex conjugate of the other theory. If you write down the reality conditions, they, they couple this Liouville theory to this Liouville theory. That's why I'm taking this, uh, this symmetric combination. So that's again a well-defined bosonic string theory without a tachyon. So you can compute integrals over modular space and you can ask whether there's a dual description of this theory. And the answer turns out again, yes. Uh, it's more complicated than the previous one involving time-like Liouville theory. But again, there's a two matrix integral which is described by this spectral curve. So now this is a bit of a wild spectral curve that we'll discuss later on. Uh, it's a curve that has infinitely many singularities but you can still deal with it. And in particular, all the string amplitudes of this uh, theory will be computed by some topological recursion. Okay, so that's a brief overview of what I'll explain. Um, so both of these theories, you can think of them as being sort of irrational cousins of the PQ minimal string because uh, both of them exist for continuous values of central charges and also the string amplitudes, they exist, they are continuous functions because vertex operators in Liouville theories they depend on a continuous uh, parameter, the Liouville momentum. 
So everything is kind of nicer because uh, all the amplitudes will have nice analytic structures, and that basically allows us to analyze these theories and much uh, understand these theories, I, I would claim, in better uh, ways than the ordinary minimal string. So I think it's a fruitful thing to look at. Okay. So let me get started. And first, uh, I'll uh, talk about this time-like level coupled to space-like level, which we called Verizero minimal string. Um, again, maybe they're not the best name, but okay. So uh, again, recall that uh, we're looking at this word sheet theory. So it's a level theory, and the meta theory is this um, time-like level theory coupled to BC ghosts. Okay, so that's a precise definition, but let me remind you what uh, this level theory and time-like level theory are. So let's start with level theory that is probably more familiar. So level theory is some non-compact conformal field theory. It's a unitary conformal field theory, and it solves the CFT crossing equations. So that was established in a series of works. And the central charge is convenient to parameterize it in this way. So the central charge is one plus uh, six B plus B inverse squared. And uh, so this is just a different parameterization. Usually we don't talk about the central charge, but we talk about this B parameter. And in particular, we can take the B parameter in the interval from zero to one, then the central charge is bounded from below by 25. Because the central charge of the time-like Lua theory will be bounded from above by one. And the spectrum of this theory is continuous, and it's bounded from below. Uh, so, so all the primary states in the theory are scalars, and the spectrum is bounded from below by C minus one over 24. So in particular, this is bigger than one, so the vacuum is not part of the spectrum, okay? Uh, and the vacuum not being part of the spectrum is the main reason why there's no tachyon in the spectrum of this uh, string theory, because the tachyon comes from the, essentially from the vacuum state in the, in the matter theory. Okay, so that's the spectrum, and also the structure constants are completely known. They're given by the famous DOZZ formula. So if you ask what is the three-point function of three uh, vertex operators on the sphere, then they're given by this function CB. It's some explicit function involving some some special functions, some Barnes um, double gamma function. So it's quite a complicated function, but it's very explicit. And uh, essentially by now it has been proven that this forms, uh, in this series of works, that it forms a consistent, um, consistent CFT. So once you have the three-point functions on the sphere, as in any CFT, you can define an endpoint function on any genus G surface. So you just uh, decompose the, this, um, correlation function into conformal blocks, um, and you need to integrate over all the intermediate states, and for every three punctured sphere in the, this decomposition, you put a DOCC formula. Okay, so these correlation functions can be defined on any genus G surface. So let's move on to time-like Lilbo theory. So again, this is some consistent uh, solution to the crossing equations. Now it's uh, non-unitary because the central charge is less than one. Uh, and also this has been analyzed in a series of works, but I would say it's much less understood than the, and much less studied than the Leovold case. Should also mention that in the math literature, literature this theory is known as imaginary Leovold theory. Um, and one thing I should really emphasize is not some kind of analytic continuation of space-like Leovold theory to center charges less than one. So in fact, space-like Leovold theory does not admit its analytic continuation to center charges less than one. But still, the parameterization looks very similar. So you, again, parameterize your center charge in a similar way. So this formula you can get from the previous one just by putting this b hat to i times b. Then you turn around the sign and you turn around the sign. The spectrum looks exactly the same. So it's, again, continuous and it's, again, bounded from below. And, again, there is a formula for the three-point function in the sphere, uh, so which I call c hat. And the perhaps surprising thing is that it's related to the three-point function that we saw before, but it's essentially the inverse of the three-point function of ordinary Lilbo theory. So it's the inver inverse of the three-point function of ordinary Lilbo theory, where you put the momenta to i times the momenta, and you, put, uh, and you use this b hat for the b parameter of the uh, ordinary Lilbo theory. Okay, we'll see in a moment what that means for the string theory. And again, you can define correlation functions by decomposing into conformal blocks. Okay, so these things are reasonably well-defined things, these theories. Um, 
the value normally is, so the central charges have to add up to 26. And if you look at the equations, that means that this B hat is equal to B. And the mass check condition of physical vertex operators are that the total conformal weight is one, which means that the Liouville momentum of the um, time-like Liouville theory is I times the Liouville momentum of space-like Liouville theory. And with this, you can make on-shell vertex operators. Just combine them and put C ghosts. Okay, and then you can integrate them over a modular space as follows. You just take the product of both theories, you combine with the BC ghosts, which give you the integration measure, and you integrate. Okay, so that's uh, your observables in the theory. And one thing I want to emphasize is that these, uh, these integrals are actually absolutely convergent. So that's a bit surprising. If you have studied string theory, typically all the integrals over modular space are divergent and need to be defined by some analytic continuation and so on. But here they're just absolutely convergent. So these are completely well-defined integrals. Yeah. And um, so that in particular makes it very nice to study them because they turn out to be very simple. Okay, and uh, for reason that will become clear in a moment, uh, we call this, uh, these integrals quantum volumes, and hence also the notation V. Okay, and I just want to emphasize that this is a, seems quite a complicated thing, because uh, to define these Liouville correlation functions, you have to know this DOZZ formula, you have to know all the conformal blocks, uh, the Verizoro conformal blocks on some genus G surfaces and so on, and you have to integrate them over modular space. So it seems like a very complicated thing. But now I want to con convince you that these Vs are actually extremely simple. And I'm going to do that by uh, showing a sort of, if you're a mathematician, a little bit sketchy argument, which I think can be made more precise. Uh, but I hope you forgive me uh, if I'm not super precise. That's why I put the danger sign up there. OK, so there's an argument how to derive uh, the matrix model. And um, you can derive it by thinking about Verizoro conformal blocks on your Riemann surface that you consider. And the nice thing that was pointed out very long ago by Hermann Velinde is that these conformal blocks admit an inner product. And the inner product is as follows. So you can get it by thinking of conformal blocks appear if you quantize uh, Teichmüller space. So if you view Teichmüller space as a phase space and quantize it, then uh, the Hilbert space well, the wave functions are essentially just Verizoro conformal blocks. And by geometric quantization, you can derive an inner product on these conformal blocks. But uh, independently, you can just accept this, conform uh, this inner product. So if you take two conformal blocks, they are labeled, uh, so they live on this Riemann surface sigma, and they're labeled by some Liouville momenta P and P prime. Um, then the conformal block is just you take one conformal block the inner product, you take this conformal block complex conjugate times the other one, uh, and you want to integrate over the phase space. And that's what geometric quantization tells you, which is Teichmüller space. So Teichmüller space is the universal covering space of modular space. But for this integral to be well-defined, essentially the same considerations as in string theory apply. So we need a central charge, because locally this integral looks like, a, uh, like an integral that we encounter in string theory. So the total central charge must be 26. And so we need to supply this integral with some other factor that makes the center charge 26. So this uh, conformal block carries a conformal anomaly of C, center charge C. So this factor has to carry conformal anomaly of center charge 26 minus C. And it turns out that the uh, essentially unique thing you can put here is exactly this time-like level correlation function. And then again, you put the BC ghosts uh, to define the integration measure and you integrate over modular space, over Teichmüller space. Okay, so that's an inner product uh, on the space of Liouville conformal blocks. And uh, you can figure out what this inner product is uh, by noticing that, it's, um, that crossing transformations with respect to this inner product are unitary. Uh, that just follows from the definition. And because they're unitary, that imposes very strong constraints on these conformal blocks. And uh, these constraints allow you to bootstrap a more explicit formula for this uh, inner product. And the explicit form is very simple. So it just puts all the momenta, the internal momenta. So this, this bold phase P uh, is just a collection of all the internal momenta. They're like 3G minus 3 plus N of those. Um, they have to agree on both uh, sides. So all the, this, with respect to this inner product, the conformal blocks are orthogonal. And then there's some density down here. And the density is basically uh, the OPE density that appears in Liouville. So for every... Um, 
So conformal blocks, to define them, you need some pair of pants to composition on the Riemann surface. And for every pair of pants, you get a factor of the DOZZ formula. And for every cat uh, that you do to define your pair of pants to composition, you get some normalization factor that you can identify with the inverse of the two-point function in the Liouville theory. Um, okay, so you have this nice formula. And I want to use this formula because this looks actually pretty close to what we want, right? Because this is an integral over Teich Miller space, which is the universal covering space of modular space, of uh, integrand, ha half of the integrand is already correct, so this time like global theory, and is equal to something very simple. So how can we use this? Well, we can uh, do this uh, slightly formal manipulation and realize that what these quantum volumes V are actually computing they count the number of uh, conformal blocks that are invariant under the mapping class group. So this number of conformal blocks, formally, you can uh, compute it by saying how, well, the size of the, this space of conformal blocks, which you can write like this, because this row is just the inverse of the, um, of the inner product. So I'm just taking the trace of one here. And then I divide by the size of the mapping class group. Of course, this is some infinity by infinity, but don't panic. Uh, we'll get finite in a moment. And I think one could also improve this argument if you want to, but uh, I'll just continue. And uh, so we can use for this inner product, we can use uh, the formula, its definition in terms of an integral over Teich Miller space uh, of the time like Liouville theory. And here, this integral over P together with this row of P together with the conformal blocks that enter the uh, inner product exactly build us the correlation function of ordinary Liouville theory. And so finally, we have an integral over Teichmuller space divided by the modulus, uh, by the mapping class group, which by definition gives us the integral over uh, modular space, because now this, the integrand is invariant under crossing transformations, and so gauging the mapping class group precisely restricts us back to modular space. And so that's our definition of V. So V, what V is counting is formally counting the number of conformal blocks that are invariant under crossing transformation, linear combination of conformal blocks. Well, this number of conformal blocks is actually pretty, uh, we can compute it in a different way, namely by using an index theorem. And uh, so it's just because conformal blocks you can think of as holomorphic sections of some line bundle. And because they're invariant under the, the mapping class group, it means that this is some line bundle over the phase space um, which is now just the modular space of Riemann surfaces. And so you can just apply the usual index theorem, which tells you that this number of conformal blocks, and hence V, should be uh, computed by an integral over the modular space of surfaces, or curves, and then you get this tot class of the tangent bundle, and you get um, E to the first churn class of the corresponding line bundle, and this first churn class of the line bundle is just determined by the conformal anomaly. So you see the conformal anomaly times the usual kappa, kappa one and psi are the the kappa classes and psi classes are moduli space. And uh, so that, that captures the conformal anomaly. And this pi squares captures the conformal weights of uh, the vertex operators. Usually, churn classes are integral classes? Yes, very good. Uh, so you, you caught me cheating. So uh, the way I cheated is that I. Um, this line bundle is actually not a line bundle that is totally well-defined in modular space. It's well-defined in teich Miller space. But once I restrict it to modular space, to uh, you're asking why this V, I guess, will not be integer. Yeah. Um, so this P here, I allow it to be any continuous number. And then this will only be a projective line bundle. It will not be a proper line bundle. So uh, the way I... I projective I, line bundle is nothing, right? I mean, a line bundle, a line is already one dimension. Also, if I projectivize, I get a point. Yes, okay. So, I mean, is, so are you using some kind of L2 index theorem on, uh, on Teichmuller space? Uh, perhaps you can do that. Um, yeah, so uh, as I said, so that's, uh, I, I put a danger sign, so hopefully uh, you're okay with that. So um, I started with an integral over Teichmuller space of this integral and divide by modulus uh, by the by the order of the mapping class group. So on Teichmuller space, this is, um, as you say, yeah, I need probably, I, I need to refine my index theorem because Teichmuller space is non-compact, so I'm not allowed to, um, to use it. But once I restrict my integral back to modular space, everything becomes well-defined. So perhaps one can make this more precise by using some, some version of equivariant cohomology where you compute with respect to the, the equivariantly with respect to mapping class group, but, um, Hopefully someone knows more about that than 
I do. Okay, uh, but if we accept this, uh, so once we are at this step, we have a well-defined integral because now we have an integral over a modular space of some characteristic classes that we are familiar with. And this Todd class, we can also decode what it is in terms of kappa and psi classes by using uh, uh, grotendieck grimmer on the universal curve. And we can write it as an exponential of uh, well-known kappa and psi classes. Okay, so I admit not everything was uh, extremely kosher. But um, so once you are at this step, you see that these quantum volumes, they can just be computed by using standard intersection theory on the modular space of curves. And uh, these kind of integrals are well known to be described by topological recursion. And topological recursion is just a different word for the loop equations of matrix models. So that was this, um, established by Einert and Orenton and Einert. Okay, and uh, so you see already that using this uh, description, provided it's correct, we'll make some checks in a moment, um, we see that these quantum volumes have uh, very surprising properties. So maybe most surprising of all is that there are actually polynomials in the center charge and in the, in the squares of the level momenta of this degree, the degree equal to the modular space. That was highly not obvious from this word sheet integral because in the word sheet integral we had the DOZZ formula and everything, it was very complicated. But here everything collapses to something very simple. And there's also an unexpected symmetry and the, uh, the symmetry maps B to IB or alternatively center charge to 26 minus center charge and the uh, little momentum to I times the little momentum. And roughly speaking, that exchanges the two theories in the word sheet, even though uh, I'm of course not allowed to have center charge less than one for uh, the over theory. Okay, but nonetheless, these uh, quantum volumes, they have this symmetry. Okay, so now we can easily write down some answers. So in the sphere three point function, we just get one. So that one is easy to reproduce from the word sheet because I told you for the word sheet, basically the time like level three point function is the inverse of the space like level three point function. So once you put them together, they cancel and they give you one. So okay, that works. And then for the four point function and for the one point function at torus, you get these very simple polynomials. And of course it's easy to make a bigger list. And I uh, just want to emphasize again that uh, it's quite surprising that it's so simple. And um, also, uh, there is a, so if you look at the intersection um, definition of these quantum volumes, it is really true that in the, uh, the semi-classical limit, which is when the center, one central charge goes to infinity, the other one to minus infinity, this reduces just to the by peterson volumes uh, on modular space. Uh, that's, of course, expected because we quantized the modular space of Freeman surfaces. So in a semi-classical limit, roughly speaking, every volume of H bar uh, should give us one state. So the number of the dimension of this Hilbert space should be roughly the dimension, uh, the volume of the modular space. Okay, and just uh, so that you're slightly more convinced that this is true, we uh, checked the four-point function on the sphere numerically. So we implemented all the DOZZ formulas and the conformal blocks and everything and integrated them over modular space. And uh, we compared with, uh, with these simple polynomials and it seems to work. Okay, so and now once you have this topological recursion, it's easy to translate to some matrix model description. Um, and the matrix model is fully fixed by either the spectral curve or the density of states. They are basically the same thing. Um, and this density of states at large n. And if you translate using this theorem of Einard uh, to what the spectral curve has to be in order to compute these uh, integrals, these intersection numbers, you find that the density of states takes this uh, form. And uh, perhaps the reason why we call this Verizoro minimal string and Verizoro matrix integral is because this uh, density of states is in fact the universal density of states in a 2D CFT. And uh, that's perhaps, you can see that already because uh, you can see that through this link of uh, the relation to the inner product, the Hilbert space of conformal blocks that we discussed before. Uh, there's a link to 2D CFTs. So in particular, that means that if you compute the disk partition function, uh, which is something I haven't discussed, so it's the partition function a disk with asymptotic boundary conditions, then you find that it's the Virazoro vacuum character. Okay, but you don't have to worry about that if you. Um, okay, but um, so now just uh, 
once you have this density of states in the matrix model, you can just open uh, standard papers, uh, how to compute resolvents. So the, res the main observables in matrix models are these resolvents, which are just multiple insertions of traces of one over energy minus the Hamiltonian. So H is the, the matrix I'm integrating over. Um, and it admits this, uh, this expansion. So where GS appears as some combination of one over N, but I'm also taking the double scaling limit. So in the double scaling limit, I'm taking N to infinity, but also simultaneously, I'm sort of zooming in to some edge of my density of states. Because the st if you look at the density of states, it's not normalizable. So the number of N has to be infinite. Um, whereas in like a finite N matrix model, typically there's some finite support of the eigenvalues. And these resolvents are now related to a very simple, in a very simple way to the uh, world sheet quantities. So, um, so here I wrote how they're related to the partition function and the partition function are related to these quantum volumes by some operation that is known by, as gluing trumpets in the physics literature. But it's a, a bunch of integral transformations. It's very simple. Okay, and in particular, you can also use uh, this topological recursion to directly derive a recursion relation on these quantum volumes. And it takes uh, the following form. So basically, it's a recursion relation in the Euler characteristic of the surface, so in 2G minus 2 plus N. And if you want to compute this quantum volume of genus G and N uh, boundaries, then what you do is you single out one boundary. And then on the right-hand side, you sum over all ways you embed uh, three uh, whole spheres into your surface. I think this appeared in one talk earlier in the conference. Um, and so there are essentially three ways of doing this. You can embed a three whole sphere like this, where you have two internal boundaries, and the genus of the surface drops by one. So this uh, quantum volume of G minus one and N plus one appears. You can embed it like this, so that the surface decomposes into two parts, and you sum over all the ways so it can decompose into two parts, and then you get the product of this quantum volumes, or you can, uh, you can have it like this, where one of the boundaries um, of this three-hole sphere is also an external boundary. And, um, and then there's some, some function h that appears. That is the only place where this b enters. And uh, then you take the integral over p and p prime and convolve over it. So for people that are familiar with Mir Sarkhani's work, this is just Mir Sarkhani's recursion relation for the volumes of Y Peterson volumes. Uh, for the for the Wright-Peterson volumes. And the only difference to her recursion relation in this one is that this function h is slightly different. So if you take the b to zero in this function h, then it reduces to the function that appears in Mir Sarkhani's recursion relation. But uh, so this recursion relation still works even for in these deformed cases. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about uh, this first theory. So let's move on to the to the other one. So which tend, we call the evolved squared string theory. Okay, so to remind you, um, now we consider two Liouville theories. Central charges are 13 plus something imaginary, and we put this uh, ghost theory also. And uh, again, I just put uh, basically the same slide as before. Um, this Liouville theory is uh, defined by the same uh, quantities as before. So we have the central charge, which I parameterized like this, and um, now, because the central charge is 13 plus something imaginary, this means translate in, the, in terms of this B parameter that the argument of B is pi over four. So everything lies in this uh, weird 45 degree angle. And the spectrum is, again, as before, it's just slightly more convenient. Um, I apologize, we used a slightly different notation. So this little p is i times the capital P that appeared before. So if you paid very well attention, then before there was a plus here. And Okay, uh, but then the DOCC formula is exactly the same as before. So again, this, um, and regardless, even when the central charge is complex, this still forms a uh, crossing symmetric CFD. I thought you said it was one o oh. No, these it are both. It was one over for the time lag, -like, but. This is for the time lag. Yeah, -like. Now there's no time lag -like anymore. Yeah, thanks. Um, so this, this theory is really different. <laughs> Okay, and um, so the reality of the word sheet uh, integral basically means that one theory complex conjugate should be the other theory. So if you take the dagger on the Virasoro generators, then they map to the other theory. 
And that imposes you both that the central charge has to have this reality condition that we already discussed, but it also imposes you that the conformal weights of uh, vertex operators have to be one half plus something uh, imaginary. And that's quite interesting because that's exactly the principal series representation of SL2C. Uh, yeah. Um, and again, as before, you then define on-shell vertex operators and you can define your string amplitudes. Now they don't have a nice interpretation as a volume. We'll see what they are. So we just call them A for amplitude. And um, since one theory is the complex con conjugate of the other theory, essentially it means that the, the integrands of your um, of this integral are just mod squares. It's also convenient to put some normalization factor, so in the physics literature this is called lag factor, some normalization factor for these vertex operators. It just corresponds to changing the normalization of these Vs. And again, it happens that this integral is absolutely convergent. Now the reason is essentially that these conformal weights are one half plus something imaginary. And so if you sum them up, you get one plus something imaginary. And of course, when you're on, on-shell vertex operators have conformal weight one, but off-shell vertex operators will have conformal weight one plus imaginary, which means that uh, if you look at some coincidence limit of some OPE where typically things become dangerous, uh, the integral is not blowing up, but it's just oscillating, and that's enough to make it convergent. So that's uh, quite nice. And uh, this integral, this, these A's have already some properties that are completely manifest. For example, I can exchange now the two Liouville theories. Because, uh, and that corresponds to putting central charge to 26 minus central charge or B to IB minus IB and P to IP uh, and nothing should change essentially. So we call this swap symmetry because it swaps the two theories. Okay, and now you can go and try to figure out what the theory is. But it's, it becomes quickly apparent that it will be something much more complicated than the previous one. So for example, you can compute the three-point function and the three-point function now on the sphere will be a product of a DOZZ formula and another DOZZ formula. And again, it's convenient to put some normalization factor. And if you put an appropriate normalization factor, you get this uh, relatively harmless looking formula. And uh, so there's no very elementary function you can express this through. There's a paper by Zamologikov where he expresses, this can be expressed th through some elliptic functions, some Jacobi theta functions, but again. Um, okay. And this is a structure that will persist. So we'll see. Oh, very good. So B is uh, B squared is imaginary. So in the denominator, there's a cinch. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the, the reality conditions are such that BP is real. So there are signs divided by cinch. But yeah, the reality conditions are a bit confusing. <laughs> uh, good. And so I already wrote, uh, wrote this uh, formula before. So it's a complicated integral in principle. So, and we don't have a very good way to now do some trick as we did before. So we already see the three-point function is complicated. So it seems kind of hopeless to find some kind of intersection theory meaning of these integrals. And so what we did is uh, to use a very different strategy, which is why I'm also showing you the second theory because it has two very different lessons. So what we did is so this, uh, A's that we get, they are very rich functions now. They have a very rich analytic structure and they have also lots of symmetries. So for example, you get a number of poles and those poles are associated to poles of the integrand because the Liouville correlation function has a number of uh, poles. Um, they are associated to resonances in the particle formalism. And the um, A's will also have a number of discontinuities. So if I promote my P's, so initially my P's were um, something like e to the pi a over four times real. But if I promote my P's to complex variables, uh, this A's can uh, be analytically continued. But then they this integral at some point ceases to converge and it becomes an interesting analytic function. And when the integral ceases to converge, we get discontinuities. So it's actually a multi-valued function. Uh, but one thing you can, pro for example, easily do is to derive the location of the poles because they are just the location of the poles of the Liouville correlator. And it's also easy to derive the discontinuities because the discontinuities come entirely from some place in the, in the integral uh, where the integral ceases to converge, which is some degeneration of modular space. 
And then we also know much more th things. So there are many symmetries. Uh, for example, the swap symmetry that I already mentioned. There's the obvious symmetry that if I send b to 1 over b, things should be invariant, and so on. And there's a more less obvious symmetry things. That comes from the AGT correspondence in the case uh, of the sphere four-point function and so on. So what we did is just to systematically impose all these constraints on the function. And under some very mild assumption, uh, which is some growth condition at infinity, it turns out that this nails down the function completely, say for the full punctured sphere. So we just uh, translate this into some analytic bootstrap uh, program. So I'll tell you now the answer, but this is where most of the work has been uh, is buried. And I again put the danger sign because this is uh, a conjecture. So we impose all these uh, constraints, we make some very mild assumptions, and for the full punctured sphere, we have very cleanly worked this out, but this conjecture is for an arbitrary genus in the end. And so there's a very sim set of very simple diagrammatic rules. And every diagram corresponds to degenerations of the world sheet. Uh, for the mathematicians, these degenerations are stable graphs. And um, so this, the quantum volume that we had in the previous theory actually arises in this, uh, these rules, and it arises sort of as a string vertex. So uh, if you're a physicist, you can think of these rules as Feynman diagrams of the string feed theory, and uh, then every vertex comes with some, uh, some weight, which is exactly this quantum volume. So let me just explain you the formula for the sphere four-point function. So there are two diagrams, essentially. You can have the non-degenerated vertex uh, world sheet, or you can have the degenerated one, and they can degenerate like this, or there are two more permutations where you permute the external operators. And uh, then you get a sum over m's, you get a sum over single m if you have just this non-degenerate one, and you get a sum over two m's if you have a uh, degenerate one. So in general, you get a sum over one m for every component of your uh, stable graph. And then, as I said, uh, uh, I said actually the other thing. So for every external um, external <coughs> puncture, you put a sine of 2 pi m bp. So we already saw that for the three-point function. And then for every um, vertex, which is like every bulk component, you put the quantum volume. So here's v04, here's v03, which is just one, but I'll just put it for clarity. And here again, you put v04, uh, v03, and then you divide by signs. There should be actually a square here, sorry. Uh, for, but, okay. Um, and then all, for, every, uh, for every intermediate uh, degeneration like this, you also put signs for the two sides, and then you have to integrate over the intermediate momentum. So that gives you the answer. Um, so just to drive home the point, uh, this is the answer for the one-point function of the torus that we also very carefully bootstrapped. Um, so here you get the one-point function on the torus, the quantum volume. Here divided by the sine, you get a sine for the external boundary. Similarly here you get a sine for the external boundary. Here you get V03, this is one degeneration, and you get an integral over this uh, sort of loop momentum that runs here. There's also a factor of one-half here because this diagram has an automorphism uh, factor of two. Okay. So again, uh, you might be in panic uh, that this is uh, kind of sketchy. So what we did is to just, again, put it on a computer and numerically check uh, for some sufficiently random values of the momenta. And indeed, uh, we get a nice curve that seems to match very well with um, this prediction. But now we improved the numerics, so now we have error 10 to the minus 5%. So it's pretty good. Okay, so you can put this for any, uh, any genus and n that you want. You get some very large number of graphs. So for example, this is the answer for genus one and two points. There are five different stable graphs. Some have automorphism factors, some don't. Okay, but um, once you have this formula, it's easy to translate to dual matrix integral. Uh, so now this dual matrix integral will be a two matrix model and it's characterized by this vector curve. So this again follows by using the theorems of Einhardt uh, who, tr who told us how to compute, um, so who told us the, how this topological recursion with respect to spectral curves uh, works, and then you just have to tr go through his uh, theorems to translate these things to spectral curves. And the leading density of eigenvalues in the first matrix takes this form, which looks very similar to the minimum model case, the PQ minimum model case. The difference is that now there's not a cinch, but there's actually a sign in the density of states. 
So there's uh, the density of states first goes up, and then at some point goes down again. But where it goes down is uh, part of the non-perturbative definition of the theory, which uh, I don't have time to go into today. Okay, so some comments on the spectral curve. It's a bit of a weird spectral curve, so it admits this uh, rational parameterization. So remember, B has a funny face, whereas in the minim minimum model, B is, uh, is real. Uh, so this has formally, well, you can think of it as having either infinitely many nodal singularities, or if you blow up the nodal singularities a little bit, it has infinite genus. And it also has infinitely many branch points. So in the topological recursion, you have to sum over all the branch points, which are points where x prime is zero. Uh, so there are infinitely many of those, but still uh, topological recursion, which is usually formulated for finite number of branch points, it converges absolutely, so we didn't worry about it too much, and it's uh, still well-defined. And again, you can repeat the same exercise as before, and you can translate the topological recursion that you get for this two-matrix model directly to a recursion relation for the, um, for the string amplitudes. And you have to stare very closely at the slide to see the difference to the slide that I showed you in the versor minimal string case. Uh, so if you didn't spot it, the difference is that there's an additional A03 here. So the recursion relation is precisely the same, except I replaced A by V. But because now the three sphere three-point function is non-trivial, I also need to multiply the thing on the right-hand side with the sphere three-point function that I took out. So it's quite remarkable that even though the theories are sort of much more complicated, the recursion relation is basically the same. Okay, so I have like three or four more minutes, so I'll probably make only one or two more comments. Um, so one other way to understand the world sheet theory is to map it to some semi-classical gravity, and this, uh, this uh, applies to both theories, both the Versor minimal string and this liberal square minimal string. Um, and there is a well-known field redefinition that was discussed by Cyberg Sanford and Merton Taraci uh, that maps this word sheet theory to a theory of Dilaton gravity. So because basically Lilbo theory is a theory of two scalar fields and you can take linear combinations of these scalar fields and one uh, linear combination will be the Dilaton and the other linear combination will be the value factor of the metric that appears here. And there is some, some uh, Dilaton potential which is sinh of B squared phi so in the VMS case, the Versor minimal string case, this B is real, so this is indeed a cinch, whereas in the other case it will be a sign because B squared is imaginary. And uh, now you can understand semi-classically why one theory is so much more complicated than the other one, because uh, in the sign, the sign potential for this Liouville square string theory has uh, infinitely many vacua. If you solve the classical equation of motion, they tell you basically that phi is constant and phi uh, is such that the uh, derivative, uh, that the potential of phi star is zero, where phi star is a classical solution. And so for the sine um, case, for this Liouville square string theory, you get an uh, infinite number of solutions which are labeled by some integer m. And if you perform semi-classically the path integral, then you figure out that this m that appears here is precisely the m that appeared in our formulas before. So you can connect it with a semi-classical description. And one thing that is quite interesting is that actually half of these uh, semi-classical saddles uh, impose that the curvature of the metric is constant and negative, and half impose that the curvature of the metric is constant and positive. So half of the saddles are, you can view as ADS2 solutions, and the other half you can view as DS2 solutions. So it's quite intriguing that this is a theory that if you view it semi-classically as a 2D theory of gravity, it's a, it involves both the sitter and ADS vacuum. Um, let me skip this, and uh, final comment, yeah, so um, this whole story that I told you is only on the perturbative level, we also looked at the non-perturbative level, uh, you can see that uh, there's non-perturbative corrections because the perturbative uh, series that sums over the genus is an asymptotic series, and you can work out also non-perturbative corrections uh, to these uh, volumes that are resummed over the genus. And for example, in the last couple of years, there was lots of progress in understanding how to compute these non-perturbative corrections from the world sheet. From the matrix model, we already knew how to compute them. And basically, the leading non-perturbative contribution, say to this quantum volume V, or also this A, both work, uh, sorry, uh, comes from putting some boundary condition in the world sheet theory, which is a, like an instanton, 
a ZZ instanton like boundary condition, and you put any number of um, basically, so these boundaries of these open world sheets, they end on these boundary conditions where you have the ZZ instanton. You can put any number of disks here. You can put any number of annuli, so you get the exponential of those. And then you put some number of punctured disks, one for every boundary of vertex orbiters. And was explained by Ashok Sen how to compute these quantities because they are naively ill-defined in the string wordsheet theory and that requires some string feed theory. And essentially when you do this computation, you, uh, you can compute this leading non perturbative contribution. It's slightly ambiguous, so it has a plus minus sign ambiguity, uh, which is, depends on some choice of contour in the string field theory field space. Um, but what's remarkable is that uh, you can also match this non leading non perturbative correction to the leading non perturbative correction of the matrix model computation. And we had one talk earlier in the conference that when you know this kind of data, you can figure out what. Uh, what the large genus behavior of these quantum volumes and the large genus behavior of these A's are using resurgence. Okay, so let me just summarize. So uh, the 2D string theory landscape is bigger than we thought, so I explained two new uh, entries in this uh, landscape. So a uh, natural question is whether this, this is all. Can we completely classify it? So I told you these two entries which live, uh, one of them has real cent matter center charges and lives here. The other one has this funny complex matter center charges and lives here. And you can think of them as being sort of irrational cousins of the usual minimal string theory. Both of them admit still matrix models or two matrix models rules. And this Leobold string uh, for the physicist I think is interesting because it uh, gives you a rigorous model of 2D quantum gravity which inv involves the sitter vacua as well as under the sitter vacua. So thank you very much for your attention. Questions? Thanks for a very nice talk. Uh, if the question is what is the 2D string landscape, uh, we should go back and remember that the topological B model was mirrored after bosonic string. That's the way we can formulate it. So in some sense, topological B model is a model for bosonic string. Yes. It's finite, you have integration with modulus piece of Riemann surfaces and everything works beautifully with no, tach, with no analog of divergences like tachyons. The P comma Q minimum models coupled to gravity and the JT gravity and all of that can be mapped to Calabia. For example, P comma Q models coupled to gravity are given by Arjaris Douglas singular points of Calabia. Uh, self dual string at C equals to one at self dual string gets mapped to Conifold and its deformation and all that. So it seems like the whole model that we are talking about gets mapped to a uh, Calabia paradigm, the topological beam and Calabia threefold. And that could be an answer to what is the 2D string landscape. So it is the space of all these models. Now, some of these don't look like conventional space times in 2D, and that's fine. In other words, sometimes the BC ghost is not decoupled from the matter sector. That happens for, in the context of compact Calabia. Uh -huh. So the general question of what is bosonic string should certainly include all of these topological B models, including the compact Calabia, which is much more uh, perhaps interesting even than, than these. But uh, the inter another aspect of it, which is your work and other related works raise, is that the kind of Calabias you get are rather non-typical uh, non in the sense that you're getting things which are not local singularities. And so that would be, for example, you're getting cinch X and all that. So these are interesting functions. The question would be from Calabia perspective, is there anything interesting from the geometry of the Calabia threefold for these kinds of geometries? So that would be the, since you're getting nice objects like quantum volume of moduli space of Riemann surfaces, that should be surely an interesting canonical object. The question would be what it is in the Calabia language. So thank you for the talk. Um, yeah, so I mean, you get kind of these simple universality classes and I agree completely that you can, from a space time perspective, you can write them in terms of some, uh, some Calabia threefold. And, of course, you can consider all its deformations and they don't preserve the factorization of the world sheet theory and so on. I completely agree. I still find it quite interesting that there are these, uh, these world sheet theories that you can write down and you can deform them and do all sorts of crazy things with them. And, um, and, but I found it personally uh, somewhat counterintuitive that you can have these very uh, crazy spectral curves that arise and also 
the Club Yaus that are allowed apparently involved in some in infinite number of singularities and things like that, which is something um, that wasn't obvious to me that it's right. allowed. Yeah. And just one, one other comment is that the linear dilaton backgrounds get mapped to the singular, singular conformal theory of Calabia where you have linear dilaton. So that map, why you get linear dilaton backgrounds like the connection boson string can actually be made precise in the very uh, natural cases. So it is not just a formal similarity, they can actually map it to boson string. Thanks. Have you dared to think about the generalization to super Riemann surfaces and super Liouville? Um, my collaborator Beatrix thought a little bit about it. Um, so the ending to one case should be probably doable. Uh, so the ending to one structure constants of ending to one level theory are known, uh, of the time like case not, uh, but in principle it's a doable thing. I would think that n equals two or four would be even easier. Uh, potentially. Yeah, well, uh, Edward and Joaquin told us how uh, the ending to two JT gravity is solved. Okay. So at least the semi-classical limit of this theory should be known. But uh, I agree, it will be interesting, and in particular the ending to two structure constants have not been written down explicitly. Uh, yeah, I guess my question is somehow relevant to what uh, Kumran just asked. So, so when you say this theory can be viewed as some JT gravity kind of thing, you mean the gravity theory on the world sheet, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so from the target space point of view, I should think of some string propagating in the target space. I mean, is there any target space theory interpretation or some string field theory formulation like, uh, like the topological B model, right? You have the collider Spencer theory to, yes, that's to right. describe all these things. Do you have something maybe along those lines for this theory? Um, yeah, I mean, you can, what Comran said, I think directly applies, so you can make a target space model where you have the Calabia threefold is something like UV plus the spectral curve is zero, and um, th that's, that's a target space perspective. You can also try to think about it in terms of a, in terms of a 2D target space in interpretation, because after all, there are, these are theories of two, two scalar fields. And then it looks like a kind of like a flat space and target space, but then there are these livable potentials. So the livable potentials you can think of as a tachyon background. So there is, um, and perhaps you can, I mean, Victor, one of my collaborators, he wrote a paper that you could view this as a cosmological background in target space, where basically the infinite past, because there's a, in the time direction, there's a um, tachyon potential, which screens the infinite past. So basically the, the things, these quantum volumes, you can view them as cosmological correlators in this 2D target space. Question? Uh, so uh, in the space-time action that you wrote down with uh, the dileton, mm -hmm. uh, the potential usually uh, doesn't have much meaning in terms of uh, the stability of the critical points. Uh, however, the DS critical points you had uh, were uh, all unstable in uh, that potential. I was just wondering if uh, it's possible to uh, engineer any potential uh, that's completely DS or ADS all the way. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. So uh, I think perhaps the lesson of this, uh, this work is that it shouldn't be possible because, I mean, people try to define something like DS JT gravity and uh, that leads to pathologies in a dual matrix model, so it doesn't seem to be a well-defined theory. This one does seem to be a well-defined theory, but uh, I cannot exclude that there's a model that just has DS. Yes. Um, okay, yeah. thank you. Thanks for the talk. I wanted to ask, uh, how do you fix uh, this uh, possible double uh, periodic ambiguity in the uh, structure constancy in this uh, uh, C equals to a uh, certain uh, case? Uh, uh, kind of, uh, can we get uh, some other CFTs with uh, a little bit different uh, structure constants, uh, which will be similar to this one? So, so, sorry, just so understand, you want some 
worksheet CFT, which has different structure constants at the same central charge? Oh, I, I'm saying that uh, DOZ are uh, uh, fixed uh, by two uh, periodic uh, conditions. And uh, if uh, B is uh, B squared is purely imaginary, in principle, we can uh, multiply it by some uh, W periodic function. Uh -huh. uh, so and, uh, how do you uh, fix uh, this ambiguity? For example, how do you distinguish between uh, C less than 1 uh, or C greater than 25 oh, okay. Uh, okay. formulas? Okay, yeah, thanks. I understand. Okay, uh, yeah, so uh, one, this is one consistent answer that uh, the analytic continuation of the Liouville theory of central charge bigger than 25 and real. So there are these uh, difference equations that you probably have in mind. They have a unique solution. And then if you analytically continue, it will still satisfy crossing. If you just sit somewhere in the complex plane and you, you do this kind of uh, Teschner type of bootstrap of the DOCC structure constant, then indeed there's this ambiguity. But, I th but that's not sufficient to get a crossing symmetric CFT. So because uh, that is just a part of crossing symmetry. So you still need to impose that the full four point function is crossing symmetric. And I don't know whether there are other solutions. So to my knowledge, that's not known. And this is the only known solution. But it might very well be that there are other solutions to this bootstrap problem. Ah, uh, but uh, uh, at least there is a C less than 1 and C greater than 25. That's and, unique, yeah. Uh, are you taking a product of one of uh, one kind and uh, one of another kind, or they're the same? Uh, in this first theory that I showed you, this Verizon minimal string, there's one where, where the central charge is less than 1, that has a unique solution, and the central charge is bigger than 25, which also has a unique solution. In the second theory, it might potentially be possible that there are other theories. I don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, that's a good question. So they, they persist to a certain degree. So um, basically, so saying that it's elliptic, you can say that the difference o operator in B annihilates the function on like any, any of the external momenta. What happens, say, for the four-point function is that the cube of the difference operator annihilates it. So that's sort of analogous to saying it's a quadratic polynomial. So because if you have a quadratic polynomial, then the third discrete dis derivative is zero on it. And so that uh, is the generalization to a higher point function. And so at the arbitrary g and n, it's like the dimension to the modular space uh, plus one or something, power a ninth. If there are no, ah, there is another. Um, thanks for the talk. And uh, you mentioned that uh, the real square string provides um, uh, the theater vacuum, right? And I'm wondering if this vacuum is stable or something metastable that will finally decay to something else. Um, yeah, so that's a sort of Lorentzian question. So here I treated the theory as a Euclidean uh, quantum gravity. So uh, I don't quite know how to answer your question. One thing I can answer is that uh, if you look at these kind of amplitudes that we had, so they allow, say, transitions from the sitter vacuum to under the sitter vacuum because they involve these kind of uh, components where here you can have a de vacuum and in this other component you can have an anti de vacuum. Where, like, say, this M1 is odd and the M2 is even. That's a saddle point of the path integral where you have partly the sitter and partly anti de sitter. So they can transition into each other, but also uh, ADS can transition to DS and the other way around. Um, so perhaps that answers your question. Yeah. Thank you. There are no more questions. Let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> there is